Now, I get the pleasure of introducing a man who has inspired me to think differently about our work and about what we do. And inspiring me is, you know, not an easy thing. A lot of you know that. The bar is kind of high on that. So I am so excited about this. Rich Harwood is the president and founder of the Harwood Institute for Public Innovation. And he is a leading national authority on empowering people to live their best public life. He's the author of several books and essays and a regular blog that I never miss. He's a frequent contributor and commentator on national broadcasts on the subject of community and people and public life. But to us at United Way Silicon Valley, he's the guy helping us figure out how to really move the needle on community change. So I am so pleased that I can share him with you today. Please join me in welcoming Rich Harwood. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Great. First, uh, another round of applause for all our award winners this morning. Thank you. Second, you know, I get asked to speak at a lot of United Ways, and I, I pick the ones I come to, and this one was one that I really wanted to come to. There are a handful of United Ways across America who are really in the vanguard of demonstrating and transforming themselves to create community impact uh, in their communities, to really make a difference in their communities. And this United Way in Silicon Valley is one of those United Ways in the vanguard. So I hope you'll join me in a round of applause for Carol Lee Hutton and her leadership. Now, as a morning speaker, I'm supposed to have a really good introduction, a really good conclusion, and to keep the distance between the two of them very short. But you know, we live in serious times. And I wonder if you'd give me a few minutes to talk about some serious topics, about the condition of our country, about why I believe United Way and the organizations that you represent here today are needed today, perhaps more than ever before in the history of this country. And what I believe it's going to take for us as individual leaders to create the kind of communities, the kind of society that we aspire to have in this valley and in this country. You know, earlier this year, my 21-year-old daughter, Emily, and I took a trip to Germany together where we visited the Nazi death camp Dachau. And so we spent a day going through Dachau, looking around and taking the surroundings in. And as Emily and I went back from Dachau to Munich that night to have dinner, we were sitting at dinner and I was looking across from her, and I said, Emily, you know, there's something that's still pulling me back to the death camp. There's unfinished business for me at the death, death camp. There's something I still need to resolve in myself about what we just saw today. For those of you who have children, my daughter gave me one of the greatest gifts a daughter can give to a father. She looked across the table and she said, Dad, I know that we have been planning for months what we're going to do tomorrow. I know that we have a whole day schedule planned out. But Dad, what I want you to do is to go back to that death camp tomorrow morning by yourself. Let's cancel what we were planning to do. I'll take care of myself here in Munich. You go back and figure out what you still need to think about. And so I woke up at 5.30 the next morning and I got on the first train to Dachau. And I got there just a little bit after 7 in the morning. My understanding was that the death camp wasn't to open until 9 a.m. And so I thought I'd sit outside the camp and write in my journal and think some more about what I was about to encounter. But something came over me, and I decided to walk up to the gate, the same gate that the prisoners were taking from the cattle cars into the death camp to meet their death. And I pushed on it, and it opened. And I walked through that gate into the death camp, which is this vast area, and I was the only person there and would be the only person there for the next two hours. And so I walked to the courtyard of the death camp, which is about the size of three football fields. And there I stood for about an hour saying my Hebrew prayers with tears streaming down my face. And I was reminded of a stark reality, that sometimes in our lives, apathy does exist. 
that sometimes we are indifferent to other people, that sometimes we turn our backs on others, and sometimes we even hide from one another, just when people need us most. And so after standing there for an hour, I decided to walk back toward the crematory in the gas chamber, back toward the north wall. And I started to make my way there. There was an opening in the wall that hadn't been there the day before. And so I decided to walk through it. And I found myself in another courtyard, this time very small. And I was standing inside a Catholic monastery, <coughs> a monastery that the Sisters of Carmel had created in the mid-1960s. And I turned to my left and I saw a glass enclosed display case. And in it were vestments made from the tattered clothes of the dead prisoners. And I turned to my right at the end of the courtyard was another door and I walked over to that door and I pushed on that door. And inside I found a small Catholic chapel. And so I sat there for another 20 minutes and prayed some more. And as I came out, I looked to the other side and I saw yet another door. But this time there was a window next to it. And so I walked over to that window and I peered inside and back looking at me was a sister in her habit. And she came around to unlock the door and she invited me in. And we talked about her good work at the monastery. As I walked from the courtyard of the monastery back into death camp, I was also reminded that one person stepping forward can make a difference. That it is possible for us to redeem ourselves that it is possible for us, even amid all the evil and the trouble in our society at times, it is possible to tap the innate goodness that exists within each and every one of us. It is possible to do that. Now, we face challenges in our country. Luckily, it's not a Holocaust, but we are facing the worst recession since the Great Depression. And like Carolee, I believe that this recession is far from over. And not only do we face this procession, but our politics are toxic. There are very few leaders that citizens actually believe in and trust. So many of the organizations that they look at seem more concerned about their own survival and their own good, rather than the common good. Rather than the common good. And yet, as I travel this country, which I do every week, what I find, and I suspect you find it here in the valley as well, is that right beneath the surface, there is a yearning among Americans to come back into the public square, a yearning to re-engage and reconnect with one another, a yearning to restore their belief in ourselves and in, as individuals and collectively that we can make things happen. There is that belief. There is that belief. But as we know, nothing is automatic in life. Simply because we say we want to re-engage doesn't mean it's going to happen. Simply because we say we want to reconnect doesn't mean it's going to happen. Surely, since we say we want to restore our faith in ourselves and each other, if you just watch Washington, D.C., it's not happening. It's not happening. There is a question on the minds of people that those of us in this room need to be able to answer if we want to successfully re-engage and reconnect people and help restore their faith in themselves and in each other. And it's a basic question. It's not a sophisticated question. And it's not really a political question. It's a question about our human condition. What I hear people asking over and over again is, who can I trust? Who can I trust in my community to create safe spaces that I can come back into, where there won't be so much finger pointing and acrimony and blame places? Who can I trust to put the tough issues on the public agenda, the issues that Caroline talked about? The issues that people care about, that matter to them in their own lives, not the issues that are simply our board or our funder tells to put on our agenda. Who can the single mom who has two young kids who she sends off every day knowing full well that they're going to an inadequate public school, and then she has to repeat it day after day after day, who can she trust to create real impact so that we improve public schools and make a real difference in the lives of her children? And who can we trust to bring us together to make a difference? Not to do make work volunteer efforts, but to do things that matter in people's lives and really make a difference. Who can we trust to do that? You know, as
as I've been trying to answer that question, what I've found is that there's something really important that those of us who want to lead these efforts need to do. And it's something really basic, but it's something incredibly difficult at times. And it's that we need to turn outward. That if we want to regain people's trust, if we want to re-engage and reconnect them, then we need to turn outward. Which is first and foremost an orientation, a posture, a mindset, a way we think about things, the direction in which we're facing. I've done a lot of research that says that too many of our organizations are faced inward. We're more concerned with our own organizations and the community itself. We spend more time worrying about process than we do about progress. We're too consumed with activities at the expense of action. How in the Lord's name can we solve the problems of not enough kids having enough to eat if we're looking inward at our own organization, worried about our logos? and the color of our logos, thinking that maybe that'll make us more relevant and significant in the life of the community. And I say that standing here and saying to you, I just changed my logo, and it's hell. <laughs> and I hope to hell I get more money. <laughs> but it's not going to make my work one iota more significant or relevant in the life of people in our communities. And so I have three questions that I want to ask you today. Three tests of turning outward. Three basic tests that I'm going to ask you to think about today and as you go back to your work. The first one is this. If I asked you to come into a room like this, and instead of me standing here, I asked you to bring 150 people from the communities in which you work, and I asked you to stand on the center table in the middle of this room, and I asked you to look into the eyes of the people in this room and say to them, what their aspirations are, what their concerns are, what keeps them awake at night, what most important values are they trying to express in their lives. Could you do it? Could you do it? Could you stand on the table and tell people that? And would they believe you? I once asked my rabbi this question. Now mind you, I belong to a small congregation in Washington, D.C. Newsweek magazine named us one of the 25 most vibrant congregations in all of America. And I said to my friend Danny, the rabbi, if we brought our fellow congregants into our small sanctuary and I asked you to stand up on the table and tell the congregants not about the Jewish religion, not about what the Old Testament says, not about the 600 plus laws of Judaism, but about their lives and about their concerns and their aspirations and how what we do here connects to that, could you do it? And you know what he said to me? No. He couldn't. What about us? What about each of us in this room? Could we do it? Second question. Second question. Am I living up to the pledges and promises that I've made to the community? Now here I'm not asking you to go back to the PowerPoint deck you might have, or to the luminous strategies we all have, or to our long to-do list, which we all have, for sure. I'm asking you something more basic something more solemn, something way more important. I'm asking you this. If you went into the quiet room in, a ho in your home, or stood in front of the ocean, or picked your favorite place where you were by yourself, and in that moment by yourself you closed your eyes and asked yourself, at the essence of what I'm doing, am I living up to the pledges and promises I've made to this community? Are you doing it? Could you say yes? Could you say yes? Third question, third question. Am I staying true to the urge within myself to do this work? You know, what I've discovered after 25 years of doing this work, that one of the most important things is that desire within each of us to make a difference. The thing that propelled you forward to work in your community. The thing that keeps you going in the face of adversity. The thing that you hold so dear to yourself because it is so important to yourself. And yet, what I find in this society, where we're activity happy and have all long, a long to-do list, is that we often forget this urge. We leave it behind, it gets discarded. Sometimes it gets denigrated. Sometimes people tell us, don't worry about that thing that's propelling you forward, just get your work done and meet the metrics, right? And what I'm here to say to you today is that we cannot create the kinds of communities that we want and that a people aspire to unless we 
protect and bring forth this earth within us and allow it to continue to propel us forward so that we will stop at nothing to ensure that the children of this community get food, get a good education, and that there's income security for their families. We ought not to stop at anything to do that. Now, when I think about this turning out, it reminds me of something that happened to me 15 years ago when I was doing work in Flint, Michigan. I'm sure you're familiar with that community. And we had been doing work there, engaging people about their own aspirations, their own concerns, what they wanted for the community. And so one night we decided to convene all the people, the hundreds of people we had touched and talked to, to a hotel downtown on Saginaw Street. We did it, unfortunately, in the middle of January. It was a blizzard. And if you've ever been to Michigan in the middle of January, you know it's really dark really early. And so we thought no one would show up for this meeting. And yet, one by one, the good folks of Flint came through that door of the hotel into that room. And after we finished reporting out what we had learned about the community, what the community had told itself about itself, I started to ask people, so what do you think the community should do? And someone raised their hand and said, well, you know, I think the mayor needs to do such and such. And over to the right of me, I don't know if you've ever had this, I'm sure you've had this happen, over to the right of me, I saw, if you ever, you're in a meeting and someone's leaning forward, you get the sense that they want to talk to you, they want to say something. And so over to the right of me, I could see this man who I came to know his name was Mr. Brooks. And I saw Mr. Brooks leaning forward. But you know in the meeting where someone's leaning forward and they shake you off? They're not ready. And so Mr. Brooks shook me off. And so I asked another person, they rose and said, well, you know, the Community Foundation needs to do X, Y, Z. And again, I saw Mr. Brooks on my right, leaning forward, wanting to speak. But again, he shook me off. He shook me off. And so a third person came and said, I think the the arts groups and the public library need to do such and such. And I saw Mr. Brooks lean forward again, but this time he was ready to talk. He was an older gentleman, and much like a lot of us in this room who are getting older, myself included, he grabbed onto the table with both hands and pulled himself up. And he was a short gentleman. And much like in a room like this, he looked out across the, his neighbors and folks from Flint and he just stood there silently for a minute and took in what he was seeing. And then he uttered three words, which I will never forget. He said to his fellow folks from Flint, he said, what about us? What about us? What are we in this room going to do? What about us? In that moment, Mr. Brooks was declaring his intentions that only a community could bring a community back. Not any single individual or funder or organization. Five years after that, I remember sitting in the private conference room of the foundation president who funded our work, and his executive vice president looked at me, and with anger and disgust in her voice, she said to me, but Rich, you didn't say Flint. You didn't say Flint. And I looked at her and I said, no one person is going to save Flint, and certainly no one person from outside of Flint. But if you're willing to come out from your conference room, down on the Saginaw Street, and walk four blocks in any direction with me, I will take you to the East Side Civic Association and show you the good work that they're doing. I will show you the good work that Salem Housing Task Force is doing in building homes with people in sweat equity. If you go four blocks with me, I will show you the good work that the local United Way is doing as well. When I was getting on the plane to go to Dachau, to go to Munich, to fly over to Germany, the last email I picked up on the jetway going into the plane was from a woman named Annie Oper in Flint, Michigan, who works at Woodside Church. And one of the great honors I had was one Sunday being asked to preach there. In the subject line of her email, it said, Flint, Mich Kiplinger Magazine names Flint, Michigan, one of 11 comeback cities for 2011. For 2011. I opened up the email, I clicked it open, and there I just saw one line. I hadn't talked to Annie in 10 years. And she said, Rich, Rich, you see, all the hard work over those years is paying off is paying off. Now what was it that enabled the folks of Flint to be able to step forward in 
the face of great adversity, where tens of thousands of auto worker jobs were being lost each year. What was it that enabled them to step forward and do the work? What is it that enables any of us in this room, day after day, to keep stepping forward and doing this work? I can tell you about all the sophisticated things that the Institute has created that answers this question. But I'd rather tell you about two things I think we need more than anything, particularly now in the country. And the first one is this. The first one we spend a lot of time talking about, but I'm not quite sure how present it is uh, in many of our communities. And it's courage. I think we need courage. I think we need courage to put a stake in the ground and say to people in our communities, we want to be crystal clear about what we stand for. We want to be crystal clear about what we're trying to achieve. We want to be crystal clear so you can see us and know how we're working in the community's interest. I think we need to put that stake in the ground, which requires courage. I think if we're going to want to turn it outward and re-engage and reconnect people, we're going to need the courage to engage people who are often seen as being disenfranchised or left out in our communities, who we often talk about but never speak with. And for many of us, it's going to be uncomfortable to go to the places where they live, because for many of us, we haven't been there. But it's not too late. It's not too late. We need courage figure out which partners we really need. As I work with groups across the country, what I keep finding over and over again is that we have too many partners that are holding us back and holding us down. We have legacy partners who long ago maybe made sense to work with, but it's time to cut loose from them. It's time to cut loose from them. And so I think we need the courage to figure out who is it that we really should run with to make a difference in our communities and to focus on them. I think we need the courage to understand the reality of our community and then to pick off our piece as a contribution about what we're going to try to resolve and act on. Which means we can't believe we can do everything, but it does mean we have to do some things. It does mean we have to do some things. And I think we need the courage to make a bet, a simple bet, that the number of people who may not like our new direction or our focus and where we put our stake, my friends, they're going to be far outnumbered by the number of people who are standing on the sidelines right now, waiting to trust someone to come back into the public square and re-engage and reconnect and restore their belief in themselves and others. There are far more people on the sidelines than those we will lose. And I think that's a bet worth taking. But you and I both know that courage by itself can often lead to arrogance. Right? It can lead to hubris. Courage by itself can lead us astray. And so with courage, the flip side of courage, in my mind, in my experience, is humility. We lack a lot of humility in our country right now. And it seems to me if we're going to do this work, we need more humility. We need to know that at some point, we're going to have to pick up that stake we put in the ground and move it in public. Partly, maybe because the conditions in the community change, and we need to change with them. Or maybe we simply put it in the wrong place to begin with, and we need to move it. We need to have the humility, we need to have the humility to recognize that we don't have all the answers. And that to solve the kinds of problems, the challenges we're facing here in the Valley, we need all of us, not just some of us. And we need everyone's contribution. We need to know that if we're trying to mobilize people and gain more partners, the days of taking all the credit for the work that's being done have to be over. We need more humility to recognize that if we want people to come on the journey, then we, we better share the credit with them. We better share the credit with them. It seems to me that we need humility because in order to engage people, we need to open ourselves up and make ourselves vulnerable. And when we do, we will hear things that we don't want to hear. We will hear the pain that exists in the community. And we will hear, at times, people's complaint about our own shortcomings, about the pledges and promises we did not fulfill, about the stake that we put in the ground that wasn't a true stake. And it seems to me that if we want to re-engage and reconnect people and mobilize them for the common good, we need to have the humility to hear what they have to say and to stay in the game with them. And lastly, I think we need humility to recognize that we can't be all things to all people. That we have to make choices. 
And then in making choices, we are picking where we want to go and where we're not going. And so we, if we insist on being all things to all people, we won't be anything to anyone. And the kids that we're concerned about, the families we want to help stabilize and get a shot at the American dream, we won't be able to give them a true shot if we're working to be everything to all people. Now when I started, I talked about why some of us do this work. And I think each of us has our own story. I know you asked me this question as I was meeting this morning about why I do this. And so I want to tell you about how I got into this work and why I do it, not simply to tell you my story, but maybe to remind you of your own story, about why you do this work, about why it's so important. For me, what I've come to understand is that it started when I was a kid and I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, which in the early 1960s was a death sentence. No one ever expected me to uh, make it this far, and certainly no one ever expected me to have the honor to talk here today before you. One of my doctors turned to my mother at one point and said to her, face it, he's a lemon. He's a lemon. I spent much of my childhood in hospitals and a good portion of my adulthood as well, with doctors and specialists and nurses all wearing their white coats and circling my, my bed, all talking to each other and never talking to me. I write a lot about hope. I suspect it's because I learned something about hope sitting in those hospital beds. Because for me, it was likely that tomorrow was not going to be better than today. It was likely that tomorrow was going to be worse than today. I spend almost every week of my life on the road somewhere, working with communities and groups. And to this day, like in the Hilton in San Jose, when I walk into a hotel room, it reminds me of a hospital room. It's only the last handful of years that I don't sleep in a hotel room with all the lights on and where I don't stay fully dressed in order to go to bed. But I was lucky. I was one of the lucky ones. When I was young, I met this guy named Ray Rivers, who became my coach all through New York through sports. And Ray was the guy at Saratoga Racetrack, where I grew up in upstate New York, where he drove the tractor around Saratoga Racetrack after each race to smooth out the field for the thoroughbreds. And so when I was eight years old, I joined Mr. Rivers' basketball team. And what I found out was that most of the games were on Saturday morning. And my parents insisted, like I insisted with my children, that I had to go to religious school on Saturday mornings. Unbeknownst to me, Ray found this out. And he went to all the other coaches in the league, his drinking buddies. And he sat them down and he said, I've got this little Jewish boy who wants to play ball, but his parents won't let him play on Saturday morning. The times we've got scheduled. And so Ray got almost every one of our games we said. I've coached his sports for 30 years now. I've never seen anything like that before and since. When I was playing ball with his son Danny in high school, in the dead of winter, much like in Michigan, where it gets really dark really early, it's really cold, Mr. Rivers would pick up eight of us boys after basketball practice and stuff us in a Chevy and Pallet before seatbelt walks. <laughs> but every night he came to practice and picked us up, all eight of us. And for the next hour, 90 minutes, one by one, he dropped us off at our door and made sure that we were on the right path. I spent a lot of weekends at Mr. Rivers' house. And I had vivid memories of him and Mrs. Rivers coming back from food shopping. And I'm pretty sure they used government assistance to buy many of those groceries. And yet Mr. Rivers was always the one to say to all these high school kids, come on into the kitchen, eat whatever you want, let's drink together, let's have a picnic together. We want you in our home. We want you in our home. I tell you this because it's easy for us to forget people like Mr. Rivers. And yet, it seems to me that the work that we do is about people like Mr. Rivers. People who might be, be in need, but people who are the backbone of our community and represent the goodness of our country. It's easy to forget. When I was at Princeton for graduate school, I had a professor who was an assistant secretary of commerce who used to come up from Washington, D.C. every week to teach us. And the course was on trade policy, and I remember raising my hand in one class and saying to the professor, what about the auto workers or the other workers who lose their jobs as we go through this transition period? 
And my professor said, that's not a relevant question for this class. When I worked on my 20th political campaign when I was 23 years old, where I was the top aide to all the senior people on a U.S. presidential race, and I sat in most of the meetings on polling and advertising and messaging, I kept for the life of me trying to figure out how our campaign related to Mr. Rivers. And what I found out was it didn't. And very few people on that campaign cared. They wanted to win, and they would do anything to win. And so what I found out is that my calling is less about striking fear in people's hearts and more about finding ways that we can repair the breaches in our society. When I worked for a swanky nonprofit in Midtown Manhattan, we were called down to Institute West Virginia in 1985 with a chemical plant, Blue, the sister plant to the plant in Fort Paul, India. And people there were worried about their safety and also their livelihood. Because if there were too many restrictions placed on the plant for their safety, they'd lose their jobs. And I'll never forget my colleagues from Manhattan saying to me as we were flying back from Charleston, West Virginia on the flight, turning me and saying, I never want to go back to West Virginia again. The people there aren't educated. They drive beat up cars. And there's an odor. There's an odor. It seems to me that we have to keep focused on what the essence of our work is, about why we're called to do this work, about why we're really trying to create the change that we're creating. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say today is that, you know, sometimes, sometimes this work we do can sound academic, but for me, there's nothing academic about it. Sometimes we can convince ourselves, if we just check the boxes in the process or the approach or the model that someone's giving us to create change, that somehow that will be enough to create change and keep us on the path we ought to be on. Sometimes we forget that the survival of our organization is only relevant insofar as our organization serves the common good, not simply our own good. Sometimes we can forget that. And so for me, for me, this work is a fight. It's what I've come to believe after all these years of doing this work. It's not a process, it's not a model, it's not an approach. At its heart, it's a fight. It's a fight to ensure that every person in Silicon Valley, in California, in the rest of the country has a place at the table and a voice in our public discourse, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of which side of town they come from, regardless of how much money they have in their wallet, and regardless of what kind of car they drive. It seems to me that this is a fight to create impact for that mom with two kids, where she wants to know, are we going to give her kids a shot at the American dream or not? It's a pretty basic question from where she sits. It's a fight to create that impact and move the needle on those issues. It's a fight to bring people back together in our country, to restore our belief in ourselves as individuals and in ourselves collectively, that we have the ability, the wisdom, the knowledge, the wherewithal, the power, to make a difference in the world, and to make a difference in our lives. And it seems to me it's a fight to turn outward toward our communities, and as they would say, United Way, find more and better ways to at least move in the direction of living united. And so I thank you. I thank you for having me here this morning. I thank you for listening at a breakfast. It's not always easy. I thank you for all the good work that you do. And most of all, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to know that we're in this fight together. Thank you so much.